Welcome to another adventure with JNL Video Postcards as we travel across Central Florida and head to the town of Geneva. This video is going to be a first as out of respect for the audience, we are starting to add timestamps so that everyone can bounce around or skip whole portions of the story if they are not interested in a particular portion of it and they're interested in another part. Geneva is a very small town without much of note. They at least have a post office and a small museum that is only open for two hours and four days a month. Unfortunately, this day was not one of those days. What really brings us to Geneva today is Geneva Cemetery, established in 1880. The cemetery is interesting enough by itself with its own unique history, but what we are interested in today is one fairly recent addition to the residence here, and only part of it made it. Today we are looking for the grave of Lewis Thornton Powell. Who is Lewis Thornton Powell? I'm glad you asked. The tale of Lewis Thornton Powell's life is only slightly more interesting than the story of how his remains came to travel here in Geneva. Lewis Powell, also known by his alias, Lewis Payne, was the youngest son of Reverend George and Caroline Patience Powell's eight children. When the Civil War broke out, a 17-year-old Lewis enlisted in the 2nd Florida Infantry in Jasper. Lewis suffered a wound to his wrist at Gettysburg and was captured by Union troops. He was then sent to a prison hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Lewis's stay at the hospital was a brief one, though, two weeks, as he escaped and made his way to Virginia, where he joined the 43rd Virginia Cavalry Battalion. In January of 1865, Lewis deserted and crossed to the Union side, where he took the oath of allegiance to the Union and first used his alias, Lewis Payne. At some point in late January or early February 1865, Powell encountered none other than John Wilkes Booth outside a hotel in Baltimore. Booth bought Powell lunch and recruited Powell into a scheme to kidnap Abraham Lincoln. The payoff for the Confederacy being the embarrassment of President Lincoln and they wanted to trade him for Confederate prisoners of war. When the plot did not go as planned, Booth then began planning his infamous plan to kill Abraham Lincoln and other members of the president's cabinet. On the evening of April 14, 1865, Booth was able to carry out his mission of assassinating the president at Ford's Theater. Lewis Powell's part in the plot was to kill Secretary of State William Seward. Powell went to Seward's home and stabbed his way through four people before he got to a bedridden Seward that was recovering from an illness at the time. After stabbing Seward, Powell panicked and ran from the house, leaving William Seward with wounds that would leave him disfigured for the rest of his life. Lewis Powell managed to evade the manhunt, looking for him for three days until he decided to seek refuge, dressed as a laborer at the home of fellow conspirator Mary Surratt. As a classic case of bad timing for Lewis, though, he showed up at Mary Surratt's home just as she was being arrested and Lewis was taken into custody by the authorities. Lewis was confined, placed on trial, found guilty, and sentenced to death by hanging. On July 7th, 1865, Lewis Powell was then hung to death along with the rest of his co-conspirators. The story of Lewis Thornton Powell and his eventual residence in the Geneva Cemetery does not end at his death. After the hanging, the bodies of the conspirators were buried along with Booth at the east wall of the prison yard. The coffins were moved a time or two, but in 1865, the families of the conspirators convinced President Johnson to turn the bodies over for a proper familial burial. The story goes that Powell's family chose not to retrieve the body and it was left to be buried, disinterred, and reburied a few more times at various places with one exception, Powell's skull. The funeral operator A.H. Goller of Goller's Funeral Home chose to retain his skull sometime in 1869. The skull was then donated in 1885 to the Army Medical Museum and then was transferred to the Smithsonian in 1898. The skull was stenciled with the number 2244 and somehow became mixed with the Native American collection. The Smithsonian contacted Powell's nearest living relative and the skull was brought to Geneva for a good old-fashioned Confederate funeral and buried next to the grave of his mother, Caroline Patience Powell, in Geneva in 1992. After walking around the cemetery for a little while, I finally found the uh, grave marker I was looking for, that of uh, Lewis Thornton Powell, marking where his 
skull was buried in that Confederate funeral in 1992. I don't know how I feel that he's buried next to a World War II veteran, but I thought that ironic enough. The markers marked with Hamilton Blues and Mosby Rangers, both uh, both regiments he served in during his lifetime before he deserted to go do his uh, rebellious act, I guess is the kindest I can say. Uh, buried underneath the tree is his, uh, his mother. So I, I understand that they were just trying to get the grave closest to her. The thing about markers, the thing about objects is they're the only connection we have through time. And I wandered around the cemetery for a few minutes thinking about the 150 years in between when this skull was walking around inside a person and the acts that he carried out running up William Seward's stairs stabbing four people, and then William Seward himself, leaving him disfigured the rest of his life. I thought about John Wilkes Booth and, you know, one of my favorite presidents of all time being slain. And it's just a really, it's just a really deep moment. And, uh, and thank you for, thank you for joining us again here at JNL Video Postcards. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you have any thoughts, please comment, and uh, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you.